I thought that I could give the, I'm a lawyer, so some sort of lawyer's perspective on it without getting too lawyery, uh, but maybe uh, with a little sort of theoretical b background, uh, I'll try to, to break it down into some sort of very practical examples of how rule of law and human rights, and I will introduce the word democracy too into this uh, in a little while, how, how they're so intertwined and how they work together in practice. Because there's a lot, you can read a lot of theory about it, you can hear a lot of politicians talking big words about it, uh, uh, and then it comes down to how does, it, how does this work in practice? Where does it hurt? Where doesn't it work? Where do, we have to, where do we have to look? What do we have to be aware of? Sometimes it's, it's easy to see the blatant negligence when it comes to rule of law. Seeing people beating up innocent protesters and putting them in jail without you know, law or anything, that's, uh, um, I'm not saying that's not bad, that is bad, but you can, it's, it's, it's so blatant. But there are so many subtle ways to undermine or even erode uh, in, in, in societies that have some sense of rule of law to undermine that in, in very subtle ways, which I think it's important to be aware of. So I will try to get into that. And uh, I know that um, I've been told, at least, that this is an active uh, a floor with activity, people here that are active and want to interact. And I hope you do, and I'll try and leave sort of half of the time or something for, for discussion, questions and answers, but, but um, I mean, I, I would invite you to, to interrupt me also in, this, in my start as well, uh, if you have questions or comments. So, so please feel free to do that. Um, but if you're not sure if you want to interrupt, you can save it for, for a little bit later. Okay. Now, to work on this machine. I thought I'd start uh, just because it was a bit fun, especially because of the next slide, but um, Thomas Jefferson, I think the third American president, uh, we have this quote from him, which I think is quite, uh, quite precise uh, for what we're talking about, where he says, in questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. And that is one way of expressing what the rule of law is all about. Now, I don't know, ironically or comically, uh, there's another president in the same country right now, I couldn't fit in all his tweets in one slide. I just picked out two. And these are two tweets. Two out of, I think, about 10 tweets that day about one judgment from a court which uh, turned down a proposal that his administration had put forward, a, a sort of a travel ban, which in effect only was a travel ban for, in practice, for Muslims and was turned down by the courts for that reason, for being discriminatory and, and not in line with the American Constitution. Now, of course, uh, as President of the United States, he has freedom of expression to tweet these things. Uh, you know, that's how it is. But what he's saying here is exactly, you know, the opposite of what Thomas Jefferson said, or implying exactly the opposite undermining the rule of law, undermining the independence of the judiciary in what he's saying. So things change within the same countries from administration to administration. And this is, this is in 2017. And the quote we had in the first slide was from 1799. So things go back and forth in history. Um, And this is where I'm sure, seeing as you talked about this already earlier this week, you've probably been through this, but I have to go through that again. The rule of no law and, and the narrow meaning of the term is basically 
uh, a concept of a society ruled by law, not by men, meaning that every person is equally subject to the law, including, and that's quite important here, those who govern, or government, if you like. And this is often said as, the, as an opposition or as opposed to an autocracy, a dictatorship, oligarchy, or other forms of more authoritarian, totalitarian regimes. But, and there, there are, I mean, academically speaking, you'll find lots of variations of trying to define the rule of law further, to build upon that. And, and I, I think, I'm not saying any definition is as good as the other, but there are many good definitions there. But, but one respected organization, uh, the World Justice Project, I think has uh, broken down uh, what the rule of law is in, in a slightly broader sense, which we will be getting back to, uh, broken this down into four main principles, and I don't think they're controversial. You'll find other wording by others who've tried to do the same. Um, and and these, are, these are the four principles expressed in the World Justice Project's words, but as I say, I think they, they can apply uh, as, as close to a universal understanding. Breaking it down to the concept of accountability for those who govern, the government and its officials and agents, that they are accountable for how they govern and what they do in that capacity under the law. So the law is on top, not the men or the women. And then the second principles, just laws, can be quite a subjective term, what is just, but it's probably the best term one can find in, a, in trying to word it in, in, a, in, a, in a main principle, where, where one says that the, the principle means that the laws should be clear, publicized. I mean, people have to know what the law is. We've had regimes in history as well where only a few privileged persons in society actually knew what the law was, and you only found out once you'd broken it. Um, that's a good way of maintaining power, but that's not uh, according to rule of law. Publicized, stable, fair, and as I've highlighted here, which I'll get back to, you can see already here, they draw in something other than just law protection of fundamental rights, including the security of persons and property. I'll get back to that. I just highlighted that here because this is, this is pointing towards the other part of my topic, rule of law and human rights. Open government, we've seen we wanted the laws to be clear and accessible and published, but, but also any act of government, the whole process of governing uh, by which the laws are enacted, by legislative uh, uh, part of government, uh, how the laws are administered by government, and how they are enforced. That all this is also accessible, open, accessible, fair, and efficient. And this, of course, these are all interconnected. I mean, this open government part is, of course, uh, it's a prerequisite for holding government accountable. It's not easy to see if the government has broken the law unless you can see what the government does. And then, fourthly, accessible and impartial dispute resolution, to use a, a wide term, because it's not just talking about courts, there can be other dis dispute resolution mechanisms in a society with a rule of law but where there is access to justice provided by competent, independent, and ethical adjudicators, attorneys, or representatives, and judicial officers who are, sufficient, who are a sufficient number, have adequate resources, and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. This is the ideal. 
And because I won't get back to this point, because I just have to highlight and pick and choose some things in a talk like this, I think before we leave that fourth point, sufficient number, adequate resources. This is a typical thing which you can see in many countries or jurisdictions, as lawyers call them, in our narrow, narrow view of the world. Everything can look so good on paper. There is independence, formally. There is separation of power. But if there's not enough funding, if judges aren't making money enough to make a, a you know whatever in relative terms in that society is is enough money to to make a living, uh, if the courts aren't able to handle the cases in a fair and and professional way because there are is a lack of resources, you risk you risk judges maybe being partial to the government, hoping that their wages will rise because they're too low to go on. That's not good. And you'll have problem with access to justice for people because they might have to wait for years to get their case decided. Uh, and often then it's too late to get it decided in a civil lawsuit, for instance. Just as examples, and I, th just, I, just, I thought that's an important thing to just mention now since I won't get back to it because that is an area uh, where in otherwise seemingly perfect systems, it can do a lot of damage to the whole rule of law system and, and uh, really undermine the judiciary's actual role in society. And of course, that's difficult because some countries have less resources than others. So uh, there's no doubt that it costs money to build a solid rule of law based democracy. It does, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humble to that when I, if I travel around sometimes trying to advise authorities and, and countries trying to build democracies. It's really easy on paper, but even if the will is there, if you don't have the money to build proper judiciary system, what do you do? And how can you criticize someone if they don't have the resources to do it? Well, it always helps if the will is there anyway. But that's an important issue that I think is often um, less talked about. Now, there are many ways uh, to look at this. I like doing it like this. So you see, we have. Uh, if we, if, we, if we forget that we just looked at the principles here, which sort of uh, uh, build upon and beyond the narrow definition of rule of law, which is just that law decides what's right and wrong, and the governed are also the governed are also ruled by law. That's just the narrow interpretation. Uh, if we throw democracy into the equation, and I think in this room we all agree that that's a, a good idea. We can talk about other types of society and the democracy, but then I can leave the room because I won't be capable of discussing that in, in, in these terms. But if we throw democracy into the equation here, how does democracy function over time or ultimately survive over time? Well, that's where rule of law in my opinion, my experience, I think there's some empirical evidence for that. You need to put in some sort of fundamental rights. And I'm sorry if this can be basic uh, for some, but it's, this is important. And I feel sometimes you have to remind even the most advanced politicians uh, in various countries about the basics. If you have a country where there's elections, so the people, the electorate, they can actually choose 
let's say we have separation of powers. We, let's just establish that so we don't have to go through that. You have you know, the government, you have the legislative, the parliament, and you have a judiciary. And then you have, then you have the electorate. They can, they, let's say every four years, they're allowed to vote so that you can have a change of parliament and ultimately then maybe a change of who's in government. Change the majority. And you can have rule of law in the narrow sense that there are laws made that everyone has to abide by. Now, if you don't, if we haven't put in fundamental rights yet, what is there to stop whoever happens to be in power? Let's say, to make it simple, after the first election in that society, someone gets a majority, they're in power. What's to stop them in a system which just has elections and the narrow sense of rule of law to make laws which are equal in wording or formally for everyone saying there's freedom of speech here but you're not allowed to say anything which criticizes the government. That goes for the government too. We won't do it either. You understand what I'm getting at? and I'm only starting with a little bit of this. There is nothing in the society we envisage now which would stop them from doing that. Because they enact laws that's rule of law, and the laws apply, formally speaking, equally to everyone. You could easily, in a, in a society like that, you could kill any chance of opposition, of real opposition. You could do the same with the right to privacy. So the government had full control over whatever was moving in the homes of discussions trying to form opposition to the ruling majority, etc. You could ban freedom of assembly or organization saying it's equal for everyone. But it doesn't count, of course, if you're in government, because government has to be organized. But that goes for everyone who happens to be in government. We just happen to be there now, so we can do it. I won't pull that very much further. I think you've got the point. I mean, this is where the fundamental human rights come in, at least if we're talking about the civil and political rights. Because uh, to counter that sort of effect in something which at the outset is a democracy and has a narrow sense of rule of law, to counter that being misused to make laws which, in, in effect, by, by uh, enforcing those laws, you could kill all the prerequisites for there being a living democracy. People wouldn't be informed about what's going on in government, so they wouldn't have an informed opinion. And even if they did, they wouldn't be allowed to voice it as far as, it, as, as long as they were criticizing the government, for instance, and, and other laws one could make. So there you get... Um, there you get the, the role of fundamental rights. And if we remember the principles from, from the World Justice Project, for instance, they'd thrown in the fundamental rights in these principles as a part of rule of law. Um, but in the narrow sense of it, there's no mention of fundamental rights. But that's their place. Um, and just to... I will be giving negative examples from my own country as well, so uh, don't worry that I'm using some examples from our constitution now. Uh, is just, and this is quite a, we have a very old, I think the, the second oldest functioning constitution in the world, but it's been amended many times. It didn't look like it looks today in 1814. And, and not very many years ago, we had, among other things, this put into our constitution that the Constitution shall ensure democracy, a state based on rule of law and human rights. And that expresses what I'm getting at here. Because you, if you want to ensure democracy, yes, you need rule of law, but you also need at least certain human rights. And 
if we if we look at just to take we have other conventions but I, as far as i could see from the participants list we are all from countries which are uh, are party to the european convention on human rights and i'm sorry if i miss someone who's outside uh, but but this isn't controversial in terms of international conventions on human rights. Um, of course, this convention contains a lot of other rights, and there are, there, are, there are protocols to the convention which are relevant too, but I just picked out sort of uh, the main rights and freedoms which are in, in this chapter. And you can see that an interesting thing there, I think, if you look at this, um, I've tried to put in, uh, what do you call it, italics, you know, when the letters uh, tilt like that, Article 6 and 7. Because I would say from as, I mean, the, the substance of the articles as such, those are maybe the only two which you'd sort of directly associate with the sort of narrow term rule of law. No punishment without law right to a fair trial. But as I'll show you, all, a lot of the other rights, which are fundamental rights, which I think, you know, are, they're necessary for a functioning democracy. I'll get back to, to why. But as I'll show you, they also, they contain their material civil and political rights, but in the articles, stating what the right is, and, and for a lot of them, which are relative rights, I mean, rights which, which, you, can, uh, which you can, which you can accept uh, some, some, oh, my English, um, infringements on, uh, on certain conditions, relative rights. You'll see rule of law elements in the articles or the rights themselves on how they're supposed to be practiced. And the important thing with these rights is, of course, that in, in the convention's term, now the convention is a convention which countries can choose or not choose to be party to. And of course, I'm sure you all know there is a court of human rights in Strasbourg, which, which, uh, which can give judgments and complaints from citizens of every member state and uh, make judgments of whether that state has violated one or more of the rights. Uh, but it doesn't have any other enforcement power for those judgments. That's up to the national, national countries. But the idea here is, of course, that this is a limitation. These are all, they contain limitations both on what government can make when it comes to laws that infringe any of these rights, like freedom of expression, and also how they can, how they can um, practice the laws that they have. Ensuring, I mean, this is, this is a protection of what we would call a, a liberal, democratic, rule of law-based system. Because the convention's idea is that you can make whatever laws you like, that's democracy, you know, the majority can do that, but there are certain things that the majority cannot take away from the population and in effect from the minority or the opposition at any time. This is a barrier to that type of uh, dynamics that I explained or, or, or made first when we had just the narrow interpretation of, of rule of law. And just as an illustration, I would love to go through a lot of the articles here, but I've just I've chosen one which is a pretty I mean, the, none of them are. Uh, really more important than the others, and they're all very interdependent, but of course freedom of expression is, is, is a sort of a stereotype for a, a fundamental democratic freedom. Um, and I don't know how many of you have actually seen what these articles look like. I'm not going to elaborate on the complete material content, but uh, and you have many other articles like protecting private life built up in the same system where the first paragraph which states what the right is and that is the main rule. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression including to hold opinions, to receive, impart information, ideas, 
etc., without interference from public authority. And as many of these rights, it's a relative right, so it is possible to make some exceptions, but that's the exception. And as the second paragraph says, states can make whatever conditions, restrictions, or penalties, or whatever, but provided as a minimum that these are uh, prescribed by law, there you have the rule of law again. If you want to make an exception to someone's freedom of expression, you at least have to put it down into law. But that's not enough. Any use of a law like that also has to be necessary in a democratic society, in the interests of, and then there's a lot of legitimate purposes. I've never really seen any government having problem to find one of these purposes fitting their case, so that's not really where the problem lies. The problem in case law in, 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 uh, in Strasbourg court is either that the law doesn't exist or that the law that whatever state we're talking about uh, has, has, has said this is the law we're using to to sanction someone's freedom of expression, that the law isn't good enough, or it's too vague, it's not accessible or foreseeable that this law can be used in that way. But most often, it's the criteria necessary in a democratic society. And seeing as uh, we're, we all agree, and that's the basis for the convention, freedom of expression is necessary for a democratic society, for something, for it to be necessary to infringe that fundamental right is in itself an expression of a very, very narrow uh, exception. It should normally not be necessary. On the on the contrary, freedom of expression is necessary for for uh, for a democratic society. And. Um, uh, again, I won't get in more to the material bit of this here, but necessary, it's all got to do with proportionality and the fact that, you know, the, you shouldn't make larger restrictions than whatever the legitimate aim can, can justify, uh, et cetera. And, and if we're talking about political speech, it's even narrower than it is if it's commercial speech. There are lots of variations here. But the whole point is, this is a protection of not only individual people's right to speak their mind for the sake of it, for the feeling of, of uh, personal autonomy, but also protecting the collective, protecting democracy as such, making sure that there will never be a government which can, which can, uh, which can, can stop the opposition from voicing their criticism and their opposing politi political views. This is what it, that's, that's how this is supposed to function. And you can see rule of law elements in the requirements uh, in the second paragraph for actually um, infringing on that right. And before I start getting a little bit more practical towards the end of my monologue where we can hopefully start discussing and having some debate. I know this was a very brief presentation of, of the sort of the, the, the main system of rule of law and why fundament, certain fundamental rights are necessary uh, in addition to rule of law to have a living democracy. But another element which is really important. Now we've seen, we have the Strasbourg Court. Of course, the Strasbourg Court has the right, vis-a-vis -vis any state which is accepted to be party to the convention, to in effect set aside laws or at least the uh, enforcement of laws in member states which are in violation of the convention. So that is an example of judicial review of legislative um, and, and also um, also government power. But on the national level, because this court, of course, it can't enforce its judgments, but on the national level, 
we've had this equation now where we've had, we had narrow rule of law, we have democracy with elections and you know all the things you need uh, to be able to change change the change who is who's in parliament and who's in power etc and we've thrown in fundamental rights to make sure that even although you can make the laws you can't make laws uh, making sure that the minority or the opposition can't win the next election but what happens if the courts cannot enforce this. If you're a journalist and you're fined for publishing something in which uh, the government um, and the police uh, and, the, uh, and the public prosecutor, they say this is in violation of this and that statute because it uh, endangers our national security, that they publish this information about what we're doing in the Defense Department. All countries have some laws that are somewhat to that effect. But the journalist comes and says, no, but what I actually published here, this, is, this shows wrongdoing on the government side. They've broken the law. And you have to look past that formal law saying that it's uh, illegal to publish this because it was classified information, because freedom of expression, freedom of the press, according to the European Convention, for instance, says that this is a type of expression that you cannot stop like this because it has public interests and it's exposed to things which the public has the right to know. So you can't interpret at least that law in this way. Now, unless the courts have a right to hand down a judgment which in effect might even say, look, this law cannot be enforced. Sorry, Parliament, you're the lawmaker here. But you made a law which cannot be enforced without violating this journalist's freedom of expression. So we're not going to enforce the law. Now, court is also bound by the law. So unless you have a law or some legal ground for the courts to actually do that, how far have you actually got? All the courts could do then was say, well, this seems to violate the Constitution even. We have freedom of expression there, and how, that's how we interpret freedom of expression. We interpret it such that this law is in violation. But we can just say that we'll have to convict this journalist because we're not above the law ourselves. All we can say is we can see there's a conflict here. And of course, courts and various jurisdictions have, in democracies, found various techniques. We have different traditions of handling this. Uh, some courts have just developed on their own, saying, well, there's nowhere in any law it says that we can put aside a law made by parliament, but logically speaking, if, if there is a fundamental right in our constitution, which some countries have, well, the constitution must be a higher law than some normal law enacted by parliament. So by legal, logical reasoning, this should have more emphasis, which means that this has to be shoved aside in as far as it infringes on the Constitution. And, and this has happened. Um, that's what the Norwegian Supreme Court did in the 1800s in some, some milestone decisions. They developed their own right of judicial review when, when it came to laws that could be in violation of the Constitution. Um, and you see now, and this is later again, this is in, in our modern days, it's codified in the Constitution. Not just for the Supreme Court, but for any court of law in Norway, it says, in cases brought before the courts, the courts have the power and the duty even to review whether laws and other decisions made by the authorities of the state are contrary to the Constitution. But this isn't so in all countries. And in other countries, they still have it developed by, by by, by the courts and its, uh, and, and its accepted principles, but there are jurisdictions where this is still a problem. Where you have courts which they have to stop. They might point at, hit, there's a conflict here, but we still have to follow the law enacted by, by Parliament. Because 
we don't have a right to put those aside, and there's separation of powers, they would say. So that's, I just I thought, uh, an important thing to put into this equation, that um, in my world, all of the other stuff here is valueless, unless the courts can actually enforce it and review laws enacted by parliament. But of course, to do that, either they need to be party to an international convention, which has incorporated into national law through some act, which many countries have done when it comes to European convention, uh, or, and or, you should have it, they should have it in their own constitutions, have the same fundamental rights there. They need, they need those fundamental rights somewhere in law to be able to enforce them. But I think it's a, I think it's a good idea if one's uh, trying to build a uh, rule of law based democracy to actually put it into plain words in the constitution so that there's no doubt. And I think it's a good, good idea also that it's not just the power, but it's actually a duty. It's expected. But of course, you need parliament to enact uh, <laughs> these laws in the constitution as well. OK. Um, Now I thought I'd sort of try to make a, a bridge into a more open for questions and answers discussion by trying to, like I said, and, and this is, you know, I've chosen examples that I am comfortable or familiar with. I mean, there, there are numerous examples one could use from everyday life where you see all these mechanisms in work. Um, and I would, I know, I just have to say before I start this that the experience is that, uh, I mean, none of these systems, however perfect they might be in any given country at any given time, I happen to be lucky enough to live in a country which scores high on these indexes this time in history. It might be different in 10 years or 50 years, and it was different many years ago. Um, but this has never come about by someone just enacting good laws or good constitutions. Because the same mechanisms, the, the natural mechanisms of the power play, even in politics, I mean, if you're in government, I mean, you're, apart from trying, you know, to do a good job, your job is to make sure the other guys don't get into parliament or get into government after the next election. That's what you're preoccupied with. And even if you respect that there's freedom of expression, you don't like, you don't like criticism. You don't like journalists poking into the darkest corners of government and exposing wrongdoings. It's not natural. No one likes that. And no governments do, uh, basically. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an in interaction between civil society uh, and government. And freedom of expression and freedom of the press to take you know, one typical example, I think I can, you know, s say without any uh, uh, doubt that this has been fought through by individuals, typically the press or publishers, uh, but also individuals, but but typically the more institutional uh, users of freedom of expression, by going to the courts through centuries going to the courts and getting their cases tried. And it's the courts who have developed the substance of the right so that it's just not uh, some nice makeup in a constitution. And even today in modern Europe and the most uh, democratic societies, when lawyers, when we go to courts and meet the government on the other side, we get all the same arguments that we've had throughout history with Nile, but this isn't really a violation of freedom of expression. What we're trying to do is have some public order. Uh, this has got nothing to do with freedom of expression, and et cetera, et cetera. The same arguments all the time. But you have to fight, and it's the courts that have uh, developed the substance of this, these, and, and many of the other rights. 
And that's the problem. It's the maintenance. Uh, it's first the development of a system that is somewhere close to, uh, which I think no country has, you know, an optimal system. But first developing it, and that's difficult enough. But if you get anywhere close to having it at any given time in history, you've got to keep maintaining it. It doesn't stay there forever. It's, it's dependent on the dynamics of democracy and dependent on a civil society that is aware and reacts when they see any part of these pillars or this infrastructure which are so intertwined when there's some sort of erosion or attack on one of these pillars to react or at least be aware of it. And I'm just going to give you some examples which I think are, are pretty much up in, you know, uh, in our day and age now in many countries. Um, protection of journalist sources. Now, if we all, we have all agreed that freedom of expression and freedom of information is important in, in a democratic society. Um, we need to be informed about what government and, and everyone else or any other uh, power factor in society does. And uh, in practice, we need journalists to do the job for us because most of us have other things we're doing every day. So we have our own profession who does this on our behalf. And the journalists, they need information. Otherwise, uh, it won't be very interesting to see the news or read the newspapers. They can't make the information up. And of course, you have you should Freedom of Information Act so they can get out documents from government or any branch of, of, of public authority and find out what they're doing through the papers. You can't see everything they do. It's not all physical. Um, and this is at least... Um, accepted as part of freedom of expression um, as, as, or, or democracy is that even though you have laws making sure that information comes out of government and everything and there's transparency, we still need sometimes whistleblowers or sources that tell us or typically tell a journalist about something which isn't right and which is hidden from the public and which you can't find in any documents because the documents are gone or hidden uh, somewhere. Um, and at least in, 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 in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, the protection of journalist sources in the sense that, in the sense that uh, a, a judge or someone can compel a journalist to give up or, or tell them the identity of their source or hand over unpublished material to police authorities, I would say is, is, is near absolute, that protection in the jurisprudence. So that's not the problem, at least in countries that adhere to that jurisprudence. Journalists are not forced to hand over their sources. But there are ways of undermining that through the back door, especially in this electronic day and age where all communications and for all practical purposes are electronic. And governments, all governments have some sort of surveillance powers uh, which are acceptable often in, in law enforcement to investigate crimes, for instance. They might be able to do some surveillance or phone tapping or email tapping or whatever. but. The examples I'm going to try to give you now, um, I'm going to show you how this, even lo looking at it formally, everything is in order, democratically, rule of law, but where we're getting in many countries now, very, very bad laws, um, which give very wide powers, at least formally, to, to government authorities to do surveillance on much larger parts of the population than anyone who is suspected for any crime. And of course, in, in my narrow context here, I'm talking, you know, this, this, this can be damaging for many other processes in a democracy, but if, if, if a journalist's potential source of a journalist knows that it's safe for me to talk to a journalist saying that I need anonymity because by giving you this information, I'm putting myself at risk. And he can trust that the journalist won't tell and the courts won't compel the journalist to tell. Fine. But if that source knows that if I communicate with this uh, journalist, uh, 
electronically, which in practice is almost the only way to do it unless you're next door neighbors or something, if he doesn't trust that that communication can't be traced back to him at a later time, well, then this source protection isn't much, much worse, well, worth. And in criminal law, especially when it comes to laws on, on preventing terrorism or other threats, threats to national security, which often gives governments the widest surveillance powers, um, it's really important. And of course, that's where we as lawyers have to come in because this is boring. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to see because these laws aren't spelt out in one paragraph. These are laws which are fragmented. Parts in one law in a criminal code, parts in a, a procedural code, and maybe another part in another code. You have to read lots of laws in connection to see what the powers, the authorities are actually getting. And the relationship between how you define what is a criminal action and the powers of sur surveillance available to fight or prevent them is, is key here. And of course, uh, the wider the definition of what constitutes a crime, the wider the powers of surveillance. If the powers of surveillance are connected to saying to investigate uh, suspected crime as this crime, you can use surveillance powers. Now, if that crime is very narrowly de uh, defined, that's one thing. But if it's very widely defined, that, of course, that widens uh, the surveillance powers as well. And I'm just going to show you on the next slide, just uh, illustrate by example how this can work and works in many countries and to a larger or lesser extent. But what we're seeing, what we definitely have seen in, in all our countries, I think I can say, the past uh, 10, 20 years, is a move towards creating a, a criminal law, in, especially in these areas, uh, with a sort of pre-crime approach. Not only criminalizing, actually doing what we want to avoid someone to do, killing someone or blowing up a bomb or exposing information which could be a threat to national security, but starting to criminalize preparatory actions before you've actually done something, criminalizing planning to do something in the future, for instance. Um, and I think this is, this is the most legal I'll get today, sort of technically, so I'm, I hope you can, uh, and this is, I'm getting close to finishing my monologue here, but just to try to give you an example. If you have a penal code which says X is punishable, like committing uh, violence maybe even with the intent of terror. And then you, have, then you have a procedural code somewhere else saying that the police may monitor and register the communications of anyone who is reasonably suspected of having committed X. That's fine, or fine, uh, at least if X is narrowly defined. But alternatively, and what you're seeing more and more of in many areas is that you have Penal code, say penal code section Y says planning X is punishable or is a crime. And then you get procedural code which says the police may monitor and register the communications of anyone who is reasonably suspected of planning an action as described in the penal code Y, section Y. We have examples of this in Norway in our terror uh, legislation. You've done two things here. First, you've widened the scope of what you call a criminal act to even just planning it. I won't go into all the discussions there, but we're sometimes talking about what do you do? Are you criminalizing mind crimes? Uh, or what are you criminalizing? And, and who, is who is susceptible to that? But if you, in addition, give surveillance powers, which, of course, are sold into the public that look, do you want us just, are you, are you preoccupied with us punishing terrorists once they've done things, or would you like us to stop them before they do things? Everyone says, of course, we want you to stop them before they do terrible things. Fine. So we'll criminalize planning, 
and these uh, surveillance powers. They'll say in another context, not in the same day in Parliament, a half a year later, they'll go back and they'll say, don't you think it's strange that we're only allowed to do surveillance once we suspect someone of having committed a terrorist act? And now they've already legislated that planning terrorism is a crime. And then the government and then the people in the parliament say, oh yes, no, that's bad. You should be able to do surveillance to see if someone is planning a terrorist act. And then you get the second example, which gives government authorities or police authorities the power to do surveillance on someone's communications if there's a re reasonable suspicion that they're planning to plan a future crime. And it becomes almost absurd trying to explain what that is actually, even philosophically. And in Norway we have legislation like that which formally means that they can start surveillance on someone before they in their own mind have even started thinking about doing something wrong the next day or in half a year. And um, basically, as, uh, and these aren't my words, this is like one of our main professors in criminal law in Norway, he characterized this legislation, and it's not unique for Norway, this is just an example, he said, this basically gives them power to do surveillance on major parts of the population all the time. The only thing stopping them from that is that it would be a waste of resources. This, to me, is really, really bad legislation. It follows, you know, the rule of law and everything, um, but I think it, you know, it's on the verge of infringing the, the right to privacy because it is too arbitrary. Uh, but, but of course, in, in a world where, where, it's, where it's criminalized to plan to give inf classified information to an outside party which could damage national security, now if you're an insider in the army and you can see that, oh, our armed services, are, they're torturing... Uh, people they've detained in Afghanistan. That's, isn't that a violation of international law? And they flag that internally and say, hey, are we allowed to do this? Isn't torture, oh, just shut up. This is all cleared from the top, just do your job. He's a, that person is already shown to be a problem. With this type of legislation, they can do surveillance 24 seven on that certain army personnel because there's a reasonable suspicion is that he might be planning to plan to give information to a journalist about the government's own violations. And you can easily stop someone from being a bother then. For instance, if you do surveillance on them, you find out that, oh, he's having an affair. And you, all you have to do is make sure someone whispers in his ear, look, we know you don't agree with what we're doing here, but you should be really careful about talking to any journalists about it because we know about your affair, and I'm sure your wife wouldn't like to know it. You've marginalized someone, and that's just sort of one example. You can imagine many others. That's why this is bad legislation. So this is, that, that was an example of how legislation, which is quite normal in, in many parts of Europe in different variations, and which seemingly looks all right until you start analyzing what that legislation put together actually means and what sort of powers it gives governments. And the Strasbourg courts have had some cases on that now. Again, some states, and there are cases queuing up in this area. Um, so I don't know if that's going to make anything better, but this is a typical example of, of even in, in good democracies where you're starting to erode pretty basic uh, areas of any concept of rule of law or fundamental rights. <clears throat>